Our text this morning is going to come from Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 25. And some people are like, man, this is an awkward text to actually preach off of for Christmas Sunday. Um, but I really think it, it, there is so much in there that I, I do want to get to. And today's, t- today's title is called Crossing Paths. Crossing Paths. In Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 25, I want to ask you guys to bear with me as I read through all these names in this genealogy. Um, there is a purpose to it all. Matthew 1, 1 through 25. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Perez and and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asap, and Asap the father of Jehoshaphat, And Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father to Sheltiah, and Sheltiah, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Je- Achim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Mathen, and Mathen, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And after her husband, Joseph, being a just man and willing and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, a, conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Jesus woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Thanks be to God. This is a word of prayer. Dear God, I just thank you so much for helping me to get through all those names without messing up too much. Um, and Lord, I just thank you for each person here worshiping with us today, each family member that we've invited and, and, and that are with us. Lord, I just pray that um, throughout this time, O oh Lord, as we reflect on what Christmas is, O oh Lord, that you remind us of your awesome grace and your sovereignty over our lives. Lord, I just pray that every word of my mouth and all the meditations of all of our hearts may be holy and pleasing to you. I pray that your gospel may be preached and your spirit may work in our hearts. In in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I heard this story a few times, once um, kind of during a lecture uh, in seminary, another time I think in a sermon, Um, but it strikes a deep chord with me, especially um, just as a pastor and as someone who reads the Bible often or every day. and, and, and studies it for, for a living. Uh, but anyways, um, it's, you know, one of the greatest theologians that ever, ever lived um, was a guest lecturer at the University of Chicago uh, Divinity School. And he was, he was actually practically worshipped at my seminary. Like, everybody looked up to him, you know, and you guys probably don't 
really care about his name, but Carl Bart, he's a huge guy. But anyways, at the end of his closing lecture, the president of the seminary announced that um, Dr. Bart was kind of not well and he was pretty tired and he thought that he shouldn't be strained with too many questions. So the president said, therefore, I'm going to ask just one question on behalf of us all. And he turned to the famous theologian and he asked this, of all the theological insights you have ever had, which do you consider to be the greatest of them all? I mean, it was a perfect question for a guy that literally written tens of thousands of the best theology or the most sophisticated theology. A lot of people don't like him either. Um, but, you know, people were all waiting and, and waiting to see what he would say. I mean, it was a perfect question, right? The young students had all their notebooks ready. And, the, and this guy, he closed his tired eyes and he thought for a moment and he smiled and he opened up his eyes and said this to everybody. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Maybe he's saying, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I mean, we all read the Bible in different ways, right? At times we, 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 we look over what the simple message is. I mean, we have all these ideas, and it can be as simple as this childhood song. You know, some people read the Bible as just a law book. It talks about the requirements of a Christian. It's kind of like a lease contract, right? You read through it. We're like, all right, um, we got to, you know, there's terms and conditions. And if, they, if it doesn't happen, we get kicked out, right? Be quiet by 9 a.m., keep the halls clean, and rent is due at the first day of the month. And that's what the Bible is. Others, of the, others read the Bible as kind of a fortune-telling book. They love the book of Revelations. They read it, and they're like, all right, what's going to happen in the future? What's happening right now? And, and they look for charismatic gifts and manifestations to feel closer to God and to give them insight into the future. Others of us, we read the Bible as a psychology book. When we need some comfort for our souls, we open it up, and we read a story that love lifts our souls, or we read God's promises, which make us feel better. While others of us, we like the wisdom literature, we read it. We're like, we got to live wiser and better lives. How can we gain more prosperity? How can we do better in life? It's a self-help book. The Bible is a lot of these things. It does have laws. It does have prophecy. It does have counsel. It does have wisdom. But more than all of that, what is more central, that, more central to that, what stands behind all of that going on, is that it's saturated in the gospel of Christ's love. It's the good news. It really should excite our souls. You know what it's kind of like? It's kind of like a guy that mustered up all of his energy and all of his, his courage to ask somebody to marry them. And they, 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 they get on their knees. They make themselves really vulnerable, and they say yes. And, and we, you, I see these a lot of young people do this these days. You know, they put it all up on social media. They want the whole world to know. They take pictures. I don't know if you guys did this. I was more of a, a, a quiet guy, so I just kind of did it really small. But we commemorate it. You know, I'm thankful that we have the holidays to continually remind us directly of the gospel. I mean, this Christmas, Christmas is looks back in this moment where this is what God is doing, what is God is doing for us. I mean, Jesus Christ is the physical proof of God's love for us. It's the original love story where all the other love stories in this world actually gains its narrative. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And all love stories have those monumental moments, right? where we need to remember and celebrate it. It's kind of like anniversaries, the important dates, the moment of proposal. See, the Christmas story, it dates back over 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem where Mary, who was a virgin girl, went through a, a child labor in a bar, barn where she put her little baby boy in a manger where animals actually ate food from. A young girl, probably only about 13 years old, I mean, but this is an incredible, humble story for a God to stoop down so low to become a part of his creation. And not, not only does he, does he, he doesn't come down and, and be the richest man alive. I mean, he, of course he could have. He could have been royalty. He could have been anything. But he chooses to come down into this poor family, into this teenage girl in the middle of nowhere, but did it all in the name of love. You know, every time I look at the Christmas story, I imagine it to be a moment where God gets on his knees. Getting on his knees is a sign of humility and vulnerability, right? It places the power into the person before you, like hand. You put, put power in their hands. They can reject you or they can accept you. You can be elevated or you can be crushed. But this is, I, I believe, what God does. But a lot of times we only focus on that Christmas story. But you know what often gets me more curious than the actual proposal of a couple or their actual marriage. Sometimes I get curious about their past lives up to that point. You guys ever think about the, the paths that they took to meeting each other? I mean, don't we under, every time I meet a new couple, they always ask, like, Pastor Paul, how did you meet your wife? 
And of course, I tell the same story. All you know, we met in LA at the church. We served together. I kicked some game, and she couldn't resist. And now we got married. <laughs> or she kicked game to me, right? <laughs> But what I often don't talk about is I prayed about a wife for my life, my whole life. I, pr- I dreamed about the person I would marry. I prayed about it. Oftentimes, what I don't talk about is all the heartbreaks I had before that point, that girl that stomped on my heart and I cried. No, I didn't cry, or maybe I did. <laughs> all the awkward dates that I've had on before. The truth is, I mean, but all those things kind of made up that present moment, no? I mean, people think that the building of relationships starts at that right that moment where they meet each other. But if we actually step back, everything plays a role. Their childhood, their family history, all that makes that one moment possible. I mean, each person has their own stories that have led people together or different relationships to happen, whether they're drastic stories or very common stories. I mean, but, but if they didn't exist, that moment wouldn't exist. And you know what? Without our past... Even Christmas would not be here. I mean, if without the, a lot of people don't read the Old Testament, but without the Old Testament, the New Testament would never exist. Each happening in that past develops and shapes the moment, this present moment, the present relationships, the schools that we went to, the major you studied, the career you chose, the church you grew up in, the city you decided to settle in, the friends and the acquaintances that you have, or that nagging parent that always pointed you to a direction, and now you're doing what you do because of them. I mean, all those things, even our past failures and successes, shape who we are today. The past is important, and for many of you, the present is very important because it's a part of now the future. And I have faith that each, that each thing you're going through right now is all part of a plan that we'll see later. And probably when we get to heaven, and you'll see it when it comes. You know, some of you guys are probably wondering why our, our Bible text included this long genealogy. I mean, who does that on, on Christmas Sunday? It's so long. It's not a typical passage, right? And for those of you guys who have maybe have no idea on what the Old Testament has, you haven't read it that much, it's just a bunch of words. You're like, Zerubbabel and all these words. Like, I don't know what the heck they're talking about. What is all this? But maybe you remember a few of them, like Abraham. Like, everybody knows Abraham, maybe. But there's a reason this genealogy is written in the beginning of the first book of the New Testament before any of the stories of Jesus is ever presented. Before the birth of Christ, before the Christmas story, before all the miracles, before the life and death of Jesus Christ, all that, they go through the genealogy. And I think Matthew knew that history matters. In fact, even Luke starts all the way from from Adam and Eve all the way up to Jesus. All the New Testament writers, they knew that history mattered. The Bible emphasizes genealogies because God knows the past matters. You know, the Bible speaks of both our history and God's history in this world. But the crazy thing is, at Christmas, everything comes together. His story becomes our story because our story comes together perfectly in harmony when the divine and and human or divinity and humanity is brought together in one being, Jesus Christ. See, when God, all throughout the Old Testament, was working in people's lives for centuries, for millennia, But finally, in the New Testament, in the Christmas story, he shows who he is. In a person, he comes to meet us. I mean, we always hear what happened on Christmas Day, and we always talk about how we are to live because of the gospel and and get the good news of Emmanuel, God with us through Jesus Christ. But what we often don't do is we never really think about all the things that happened in Jesus' past that led up to his moment right now or led up to this moment of Christmas. You know, one pastor said in a sermon, and I read this online, and it it, it kind of sparked kind of inspiration inside of me. But let me read to you what he wrote. He wrote this. My dear friends in Christ, Christmas is crossing of paths. Christmas is where we find the Christ of God intersecting with humanity. Christmas is our first best meeting with God who has desired us from the very beginning. I mean, who would have ever guessed that this crossing of paths, this intersection of the divine and the human would take place so long ago in a remote speck of dust village called Bethlehem of Judea? The thing is, this one moment, this one point makes everything in the past make sense. If this one moment never happened, then everything in the past would be there for no reason. And because of this one event, all the random events, all the hurts, all the joys, all the seemingly pointless things 
have a greater meaning and purpose. I mean, if we examine all the heartaches and pains and joys and relationships and things that we've gone through and we connect the dots of how they lead up to different things, I mean, you get amazed at the intricacy of God's work in our lives. I mean, think about it. Even for this moment to happen right now, right now, for us in this room, isn't it a miracle? I mean, all, all, all you guys, the, the, how we ended up as a church, how we ended up coming together to worship, all the little things. I mean, it's a miracle. I mean, even for me preaching the sermon, I mean, some people ask me, how, ask, ask me, how long does it take you to write a sermon? And of course, I could be like, eh, you know, 15, 20 hours a day. I, I, but, but in reality, if you think about it, it takes a lifetime of a person to understand how God works in their lives. My failures as a Christian every day shapes me in how I realize God's grace over and over again. I mean, think about all the things that happened into your life right now for you to know what you know. I mean, in this little suburban town in the middle of nowhere, right? North Wales, like, where, where is this? I mean, your current job in your house, your spouse, your kids. I mean, how about your faith? How did your faith come to be? You know, all those Sunday schools that you went to, your parents that dragged you to church, all the teachers, the VBSs, the retreats, all the pastors that you've met in the past, whether good or bad, your friend that keeps talking to you about Jesus, I don't know. I mean, just think about all the people you have in your life today. My gosh, when I think about the past, it humbles me. I think one of the blessings that I have that most other pastors don't is I had an opportunity to start a church in my hometown with people that I've known for a long time. And it's a blessing that some, some of you guys are listening to me preach when you know all my dirty secrets of the past. It's embarrassing, you know? When I think about the past, I realize that I don't have control over all that, but it's somehow worked together to lead to this moment right now. And I'm pretty sure all of you guys have your stories. You know, as I was reading through the genealogy of Jesus, I was reminded of all those smaller stories that made that one big love story at the peak of Christmas happen. And the cross and the resurrection, all these things. I mean, there are stories of both failures and successes that all lead up to this point. And each story contributes to Christ being there. I mean, you talk about Abraham, right? Where God promises that his offspring would be a great nation. But did you guys know that they didn't have kids till they're at the age of 90 to 100? They were waiting, waiting and waiting. Nothing happened. I can imagine all the tears and fears that, that, that Sarah probably had in her heart. I mean, back then, if you didn't have a child, you were considered useless. And then after that episode, we see Isaac. His name actually means laughter. We see successful moments of the promise being fulfilled, and there was joy. And then we see the story of Ruth. Did you guys know that her husband died? But that death of her husband leads her to meet a guy named Boaz. She meets a new husband. She gains it all back. And now they're both recorded as the ancestors of Jesus Christ. We see Solomon, the son of Bathsheba, inside this genealogy, who was the wife of Uriah, who was murdered by King David. Did you guys know that Jesus came from an extremely dysfunctional family? I mean, his great-great-grandfather ch cheated, had adultery, and then he came out of that adulterous relationship. Did you guys know that his uncles raped his own sisters? And, I mean, it's a mess. It's a mess. And then later down the line, there's a few bad kings that are dumb in Jesus' line. There are some good kings. Hezekiah was a good king. There were moments of faithfulness. And then you see Man Manassas, Manasseh, or his son, uh, well, I mean, he was the worst king ever. I mean, they talk about him carving idols onto the temple walls. And they said he was responsible for the massacre of many innocent people in Jerusalem. I mean, but Jesus, this is Jesus' family. This is Jesus' bloodline. He came from a family of murderers. Then finally, God couldn't take it anymore. So the Babylonians came in. It talks about that. They destroyed everything. They destroyed Jerusalem. They were taken captive. I mean, even then, Jesus is from a family of slaves. And after this, there were years and years of pointlessness. I mean, 400 years of complete silence from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Nothing happened. The gospel, they said no prophet spoke. God, it felt like God was disappeared. I mean, I really see this point as a moment of depression in someone's life where you feel hopelessness. Where is God? And even in our passage today, we see Joseph stressing because his fiance is now pregnant and he didn't even touch her. Nothing, I mean, and, and I mean, think about this. You're about to get married, and, and, and your wife-to-be, your fiancé, says, I'm pregnant, but it's from God. I mean, if my wife said that, I'd, like, I'm, I'm a pastor. I don't believe you. <laughs> but I think about all the doubts that have happened, and I can't imagine how all that feels. 
Well, the thing is, through all this, these people were waiting for someone to come to make sense of all that randomness, to make it all better again. I mean, all these ups and downs, all these moments of, of sin, all these moments of even praise led up to Jesus Christ. The nation of Israel was waiting and waiting for a savior to come and to stop this roller coaster of wavering faith to provide some divine stability. And I'm sure all of us have our own stories as well. Our past, in our past, we have moments of joy and moments of despair. I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys are reminiscing right now, even as we speak, the past fights with your parents and siblings, your spouses, that divorce that split your family apart, that death in the family, as well as the smiles and vacations you guys went on. All those random moments of happiness in our childhood, all those faces of our friends, all the grade school experiences, the hurtful relationships, our first child that kept us up all night, or second and third child too, all the memories of the past, and even just this past year, I know for a fact that this year was incredibly hard for many people at our church, from miscarriages to sick family members to struggling marriages to addictions to depression. But let me tell you guys something. This moment of Christmas is a story, is a story of God coming into human history, and this is bigger than you think. This is a moment where God chose to come into our stories. He chose to come into human history, the great crossing of paths. And this is ours today because of Christmas. And God meets us in the very stories that we have and shows us that he's been there all along. And not only does he come into our lives, he begins to shine light on our past. And he gives us lenses, the, the eyes of faith to see that everything up to this point was for our process of salvation in our spiritual maturity you know people always think that someone comes to faith because they made a moment of decision right like oh do you accept jesus christ and, ah yes i did and we all point to that moment but to, to be truthful it's everything that came before that moment the stresses that they're facing the meaningless meaningless lives and then they found christ through a praying friend or the people who were in hurt and pain and they randomly met jesus in a church service i mean all those things are, are there right that person that never had friends growing up and they hear that Jesus wants a relationship and it all leads there. Let me ask you guys, where in your story did God find you? And can you see that he's been there with you the entire time? You know, all the writers of the New Testament, they began to look back on Jewish history, all the Old Testament, all the writings, all the prophets, all the writings of prophecy and they were amazed, amazed and they're like, oh my gosh, God was with us all along. Verse 23 to 20, 22 to 23 says this, and this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. But it's not just, oh, the Christmas story, God is with us now, but no. It's saying, no, God has always been with us from Adam and Eve to Abraham, to King David, to all the ups and downs, up to Jesus Christ, and is continuing in our lives right now. God is with us. God is with us. You know, as I was writing this sermon, I kept, a song kept playing in the back of my mind, and it almost led me to tears. I don't know, I'm getting, again, maybe as kids, you, know, you get a little more emotional these days. And In all honesty, my nose began to tink, tingle the entire time of writing this sermon because I, can, I couldn't help but think of all the memories of my life. And I want to read to you guys the lyrics of a song with you guys that was originally written by the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and was later produced and covered by Rascal Fat Flats. Um, it's called um, God Bless the Broken Road. If you haven't heard it, download it. It's a beautiful song. But it goes like this. I set out on a narrow way many years ago, hoping I would find true love along the broken road. But I got lost a time or two wiped my brow and kept pushing through. I couldn't see how every sign pointed straight to you. I think about the years I've spent just passing through. I like to have the time I lost and give it back to you. But you just smiled and take my hand. You've been there, you understand. It's all a part of a grander plan that is coming true. Every long lost dream led me to where you are. Others who broke my heart, they were like northern stars, a northern star, you know, pointing me on my way into your loving arms. This much I know is true. God bless the broken road. 
that led me straight to you. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, we usually think about this like in our relationships, right? Oh my gosh, like this is our relationship with God. The broken roads that we have that led us straight to him. You know, this song was actually played in the background of my slideshow that I kind of copied off a, a friend of mine. Um, and as the pictures flip through our childhood years and even our young teenager years and single young adult years, I mean, isn't it true? Definitely God blessed the broken road, no matter how broken it was for things to come together. But it reminds you, you know, God is blessing our roads right now, no matter how broken it may, may seem to be. God is blessing us right now as we are in his presence, worshiping him. You know, I thank God that he has given us Christmas at the end of the year as we look back on the past events that have happened to us up to this point. You know, some of you guys had the best years of your life and everything went right. Others of you have gone through the biggest changes and cheered tear-joking moments throughout this year. For me personally, 2018 had so many ups and downs. I don't often share my emotions. I mean, I talk about them all the time and ask for prayer, but I never show my emotions. Only my wife knows. Lots of ups and downs. But you know, when you're just living your life, things won't make sense. But after you have gone through it all and you look back, my gosh. You know, I promise, as Christ is my witness, and with the confidence in knowing that we have an almighty God that has the world in his hands, is by our side, and has our lives in his hands, when we're sitting back up in heaven and we connect the dots of God's faithfulness, we can also scream and shout, Emmanuel, God was with us. And God has always worked for us for the good of those found in his grace. You know, with that, I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. Um, just so we can spend a moment in prayer before our kids come up and, and respond in um, a song. You know, the Christmas story is the greatest love story, and the Bible speaks of it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And as we hold on to this promise, let's spend some time reviewing the blessings of this past year, both in the pains and the joys. joys. And let us thank God with faith, knowing that he, is, he knows what he's doing. But it just doesn't end there in thinking of the past. Past faithfulness will also give you confidence in future faithfulness. God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and he will be with us to the very end. I'm going to just read to you guys Romans chapter 31, 39 to 39, and I'm going to end here. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did, he, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us Separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's take a moment just in prayer, just reflecting on the past things, and let's come before God.